From the campus of Yale University, this is Business Talk with Jim Campbell, nationally syndicated across the country on the Biz Talk radio network and coming to you from our flagship stations, Yale Radio, WYBC, and 1490 AM, WGCH, Greenwich. All talk and all business, 60 minutes of radio with leading figures from the world of business along with the business of politics and sports. Inside Life in Silicon Valley, today on Business Talk with Jim Campbell, Alexandra Wolf is a staff reporter for the Wall Street Journal, writes the weekly column, Weekend Confidential, which is great, by the way, and she's got her first book out. It's called Valley of the Gods, a Silicon Valley story. Welcome, Alexandra. Thank you. Thank you for having me. i got to tell you my story to start with on Silicon Valley. Uh, this is years back now, but I was in systems integration at KPMG in the height of the Internet bubble. Oh, wow. Uh, and we had an office in Mountain View, right? Yeah. So I, I was out there only once because I was out in New York. But it was so intense back then that I, you could literally, a KPMG's office was across the street from Google. You oh, could, whoa, you could, everything. You could go in the morning, do your job. At, at your lunch break, you could go get a job at Google. Oh, wow. The hiring, it, it was that much free form and hiring. That's what, and, and, you know, that's why it was tough on these big projects I did for, like, G Capital to get these, um, uh, the programmer guys to really work their butts off like G expected because they could get jobs in two minutes. Oh, you know? that's so fascinating. It's so different now. Yeah, well, now, yeah exactly. Now to work at Google. Yeah, now it's, um, you know, totally different world. Well, I got to say... Uh, these geeks in the world you inhabited out there, they're, they're just plain weird folks, aren't they? <laughs> yes, that's for sure. I'm, I'm sure you saw it as well. What, what were they like when you were there? I mean, was it the same kind of level of geekiness? or? Yeah, it, it was just an intense environment. We yeah. were working on projects, and, and you know, so I, I, you immersed yourself, so I can't really, I'm not an expert or anything in that. But I, where I want to start off, uh, because we're in Greenwich here, which is the world of Wall Street, it's, they call it Hedgestan here, <laughs> it is, is tell us exactly how different the cultures and the worlds are of the Wall Street world out here on the East Coast and the Silicon Valley out on the West. Well, I thought it was really night and day in that, I mean, I grew up on the East Coast and was so familiar with that idea of having this track from... Uh, going to school, going to an all-girls or all-boys school, and then going on to college and then going to a big firm or, you know, Condé Nast or an auction house or a bank, and then um, having a pretty uh, predictable set of next steps. And then out in Silicon Valley, it was the total opposite. It sort of was this entrepreneur stomping ground where you're supposed to come up with something wacky and crazy and, and have all these weird ticks. And um, there was no, I guess there, there was the uniform of wearing a hoodie and, a, and, and, and jeans and sneakers, but it was absolutely nothing like the structured life that I had been so familiar with in New York. So I was pretty surprised. Isn't, uh, to me, a fundamental thing I noticed is, to me, investment banking, Wall Street is, is and this may surprise people, it's very risk averse. Yeah. And these guys are lockstep and all that. And now you're out in a world that's all like trial and error. Failure is almost good. Yeah, no, it's so true. Failure is such a uh, is so encouraged out there, and I mean, I can't, it can't. It's such a cliche almost at this point, and I can see why. I mean, failure is actually not that fun at all. I mean, from you know, if you do, a, if you, I've had a couple of things that have completely and utterly failed, and it's it's a it's a pretty, it's a bit overblown. But out there, they keep saying it. But I kind of feel like that whole idea of rush to the promised land and live in your car and eat a lot of ramen um, is starting to become a little bit exposed for what it is, which is just really. Not not fun, but um, a lot of people are doing it, and you don't hear that at all um, on the on the East Coast. Obviously, I mean, it's sort of there's something there's something to having a job with um, a regular salary. I mean, I kind of I kind of now see um, the benefits of that as well after meeting all these entrepreneurs who completely um, expected to become billionaires out there and ended up you know, sort of asking their parents every month right. for rent. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, so it it is. Um, it is a completely, a completely uh, is it, is, riskier proposition. Is it as simple as to say that, you know, the F Wall Street folks are motivated by money and out there it's changed the world, or is it really changed the world for money? 
Well, I kind of feel like, I mean, that's definitely what people say, but I agree with you. I mean, I definitely think it's changed the world for money. But um, but I'd rather that pretension, I guess, than, than I want a certain number um, <laughs> out there. You know, sort of everything is, you know, I'm going to change the world by, you know, putting iPads on every table in, in airports. You know, it just doesn't really, it doesn't have the same ring to it. You know, it's sort of the, um, it's not, it's definitely not for, pro, it's definitely um, an, an, a, a, um, a, it's definitely for profit changing the world. Um, so, so I it, there. I think that's sort of equally a cliche. I think they definitely want to make a lot of money in in Silicon Valley too. Okay, let me let's jump into Peter Thiel. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Founder of PayPal, first investor in Facebook, which I didn't know, made two billion bucks, and he's sort of uh, the the contrarian underneath all this stuff. Also, one of Trump's only Silicon Valley yeah. supporters. Tell us about him. Oh, I thought uh, Peter Thiel was um, was so fascinating. I mean, I just um, I met him in New York in um, in two thousand six or seven, and uh, and I just I really couldn't believe all the things. Like he just thought in a completely different way that I was used to. And even then, he was talking about um, the housing bubble. And if you said that back then, people thought you were crazy, just yeah. as crazy as if you said you wanted to support Trump now. And so. In a way, it didn't didn't really feel like there was that much of a difference in terms of. I mean, everybody was totally shocked when he said he was supporting Trump, but but it's kind of just his typical, um, you know, just exactly typically contrarian. I think um, he also I mean, I fund, funded this Gawker uh, lawsuit under the table. Yeah, right? yeah that just blew. yeah, which I think everybody was. To- I mean, it was just such a that was also a shock that you can take down a media organization. Yes. So, especially for people in the media. Okay, so um, let's go to his uh, one of his contrarian deals, which is he's anti-college to extent, even though he went to the top schools. Yeah. Talk, talk about stopping out of college and his 20 under 20 fellowships. Oh, yeah. So he started this fellowship um, back in 2010, and he paid $100,000 to 20 kids under 20 who uh who to they first had to apply and then he then then he chose 20 of them uh to start their own companies out west and so the idea was to move out of the politically correct east coast college system and go find your fortune out west um in Palo Alto and so it was originally supposed to be a um a reverse i mean one of the early plans was to have a reverse electric Kool-Aid acid test uh <laughs> Mary prankster bus ride and he was going to get a bus that um, was this sort of souped-up, high-tech version of the Mary Prankster school bus and go from the East Coast back to the West Coast and take them out of all of this PC madness, but um, which actually got me interested in the book to begin with. But th- that, that trip never materialized. But uh, the Teal Fellows did move out West um, with varying degrees of financial success. But um, they would say with complete degrees of stopping out success, um, and that the whole purpose of the program was to not necessarily make them all billionaires, but to, to sort of make them stop and think, oh, maybe I don't have to do this East Coast thing. Maybe I don't have to go to college. Maybe there's something else I want to do. And a lot of them did other things from, you know, trying to mine asteroids to start longevity hedge funds. Both of those, by the way, just struck me as, biz- I guess, visionary would be a nice way to say it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I like the term Asperger chic you use for, for these folks out there because they're kind of a... In, in some of the, the cultural cultural world out there is also, to me, trial and error. Yeah, you know, they're totally. willing to do this stuff. This <laughs> co- talk about the co-living and the polyamorous, uh, just the, the completely different from what we're used to out here. Well, yeah, that was what was funny about it was that so many... Um, they help. They always, even on Facebook's campus, they had written the word "hack" everywhere, and so everything was up for hacking. It was sort of <laughs> let's hack morality, let's hack living, <laughs> you know, let's hack sexuality and marriage. And so um, a lot of people seem to want to try anything, and it, it often they sort of um, uh, reverted to the mean and sort of became monogamous again, or they, you know, realized they didn't totally enjoy having you know, five girlfriends in the same house, like um, that that book, the Neil Strauss book, The Truth, you know, who kind of realized at the end this is really difficult. Um, so, but they, they were definitely up for experimenting um, in all of these different ways, which was, as a fly on the wall, was really fun to watch. I didn't necessarily feel like joining in, but, um, but, but seeing it was really interesting. I'd never seen all that stuff before. 
Um, so I definitely like that part. You know, um, th- this, you know, dropping out of college to run a business uh, with these particular guys, I kept thinking to myself, these guys don't even know how to socialize with each right. other. How are they going to manage employees? <laughs> right. I mean, I think that was a lot of it. I mean, it was, it, it was they, they um, so many people I met had such an, um, a methodical sort of engineering mentality that was applied to socializing too, which it was sort of funny. It was almost like they studied it, um, but their focus it was such a, a um, afterthought in a way for most of their for most of them. They were so so focused on um, on work and working all night and coding, and um, especially for the people starting companies, were just completely obsessed with their ideas. I was impressed, so, by the way, very much with the work focus of these guys. The, yeah, the work I ethic. Too. I was definitely not like that in college at all. <laughs> you're, um, but, <laughs> you're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell over the Business Talk Radio Network, 350 stations around the country. Go to biztalkradio.com, find the station closest to you, listen over the net, or access our podcast. We'll have more from the Valley of the Gods and what it all means next. All right, we're back. Our guest, Wall Street Jeff's staff reporter, Ali Wolf. I want to throw some uh, little word game out to because uh, so, the language is so different out of there, and just sort of briefly give us what these things mean. Hero accelerator. Oh yes, that was um, a, that's the I think that was a part of Tim Draper's school. It was a school for it was the uh, College for Heroes, and um, and then they had that. They also used that word at um, in in some of these co living houses, and uh, you're, <laughs> it was you you were you're supposed to. Um, it was sort of a a, a euphemism for God knows what, but uh, but it was all about sort of you know it, it encapsulated so many things out there like transgress, disrupt, all the sort of yeah. catchwords that everybody seems to use. And and pivot out there is is pivot, used. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just jump pivot around. Pivot is this great term for complete and utter failure, but yes. it's just neater to say. <laughs> <laughs> now tell us the, about the Y Combinator. Oh, yeah, that, I, you know, it's funny, I saw, I, people there might disagree with me, but I really felt like these incubators were the new colleges. Yeah. I mean, the, it was this, it's a, Y Combinator, it's, um, it, they were responsible for um, incubating uh, Dropbox and um, Airbnb, and uh, so I think because of those huge successes, a lot of uh, kids applied to, and I mean, in people in their 20s and 30s probably too, but applied to these, these uh, incubators, and they were accelerated um, startup camps, so to speak, and they didn't live on a campus, but they'd go and have these weekly dinners and talks with uh, entrepreneurs out there and uh, successful, you know, venture ca- venture capitalists and founders, and sort of hope to become one. But um, but it really was like boot camp. So I kind of feel like that was a that was, a, it was it, now it's become extremely selective, and they have these demo days at the end of the sessions and all these. Um, investors from the East Coast and, and beyond come out and, and uh, see if they can uh, place a bet on um, on the new upstart, so to speak. Okay, is kind of under what it all means. The Teal Fellows, uh, did you get a sense in the end that it worked or it was more of a mirage? Well, that's a really good question because it, I guess it depends what you think of as working. I mean, in terms of all of them having huge exits, definitely not. But in the sense of, um, of of them all sort of stopping and not doing something that they didn't really want to do in the first place, like go to college and, and maybe end up in a career they didn't want to, I think it probably was successful in the sense that it it um, it changed the whole conversation around whether it's acceptable to go to college or not go to college. So, I mean, a lot of them had a really tough time, and so maybe that's good in a way. I mean, they I didn't really learn that much in college, and so I kind of feel like, you know, if I had had, I mean, to be completely honest, if I'd had if I'd had the option to do it again at that time, I would have done the exact same thing. But now, I mean, maybe maybe you know, taking a gap year is more success, more more acceptable, or or coming up with a new company or something. I mean, I definitely want to come up with a company myself. But for these kids who wanted to, um, I think it probably was a good either experience literally or life lesson in that maybe they should go to college or it was just probably a good pause to have you know it's funny the conclusion i reached out of it was this this um 
you know, drop stopped out as they call it, dropping out. Yeah. I think the, the 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 way it fits together is to whether it's two years even or three is to call it a gap period and then go to college. The yeah, idea of I not going to college, agree. I don't really buy into this. Um, don't you think? Do you think that it it invalidated the college model? Uh, or that doing this is bad because, for especially for income inequality, college is an equalizer in America. Oh, that's a, that's also a good question. I mean, the um, I guess in terms of you mean equality in terms of um, social status, or well, I, I just mean that is the message that that college may not be worth it. Is that a good message to be sending out? Oh, I mean, in a way, I kind of think it's a good message to send out the the idea that college as it is might not be um, the best model. I mean, I kind of, I definitely agree with you in that the the people who took two years off and then came back for maybe an expedited college mm-hmm. um, uh, experience or something was was um, was 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 pretty good. I mean, I, I'm not an educator, and I, I don't have a prescription for, mm-hmm. for what college should be, but it, but it definitely seemed like it might be better if it's not exactly this. I mean, there's $3 trillion of, um, of, of student debt. So, I mean, something's yes. wrong. Um, and that it's so easy to go to school and not, um, and sort of skate by or mm-hmm. party your whole way through. Or mm-hmm. So, I mean, I guess it depends. And, and just the, the idea of spending all this money to just learn how to socialize seems also preposterous. I mean, I don't know if joining a co-living <laughs> house is, um, is uh, the answer. But um, but maybe some combination of something more personal for each each student, which is what, what I sort of came away with, is that is that maybe this four year college isn't the best thing for everybody. And if you're if mm-hmm. you're like these unusual kids, these kids are pretty unusual. Yeah. So um, so I don't even the Teal Foundation I think didn't didn't set out to convert everybody, um, but there should be I kind of think some some other options for. For okay. really unusual kids. Let me ask you this: On uh, having you know immersed yourself in Silicon Valley, are you bothered by the income inequality and the gender imbalance? I think you said it was ten to one, male to female. Oh, you know, it's so funny. There are no, I couldn't find there. There, um, it feels like that. That's for sure. Um, but, um, but there, it's so hard to find actual statistics about this. I mean, some people say sixty to forty. Some people say ten to one. Some people say like one period i mean there's just so <laughs> few um, there's so few women um i interviewed this venture capitalist eileen lee um a couple years ago and then again in the fall and um and she said that some of these cases these high profile um you know, sexual discrimination uh yes. and, and harassment cases have changed things and that it's made people a lot more aware um there is this weird paradox of where women sort of look more like men a lot of the time. I felt like out there, like I, if you wore a dress to one of these companies, people look at you like you're in the prom. Um, but um, but if you if you um, so it's sort of more androgynous, but at the same time, there, it's less equal in terms of just numbers. Um, and so there's the argument that that less women are interested in, in engineering. I mean, computer science departments, there are less women. Um, and engineering departments, same thing. So um, it could be reflective of that. So I wasn't, in the sense, um, thinking that it was something imposed upon the population, like women go away. Mm-hmm. And I think it's actually the opposite. More, they're just trying to get more more women. Um, mm-hmm. in, in the last so, uh, couple of seconds, have you got, what's the feedback you've gotten and what are you doing next? Um, I, the feedback I've gotten so far is um, I can't believe, uh, mostly about the, the open marriage and polyamory. They're like, what? <laughs> um, can I go out there? No. <laughs> um, but um, so, but um, next, I, I'm trying to think of a new of a new book idea. I haven't really settled on anything, but but um, but uh, let me know if you have any ideas. Okay. <laughs> Valley of the Gods is the book, a Silicon Valley story, and it's fascinating. It's humorous. And, and also these guys are brilliant and are helping uh, with innovation and, uh, and spurring growth in the whole country. So it's an important area, obviously. Thank you, Alexandra Wolf. Yeah. And you've been listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell.